we have the list of questions. <laughs> with the word diversity because as long as there's diversity it's not normal for things to be diverse if that makes any sense so because of this mentality people think they're being diverse when they include one or two as opposed to it just being normal that a whole cast is without it having to do with anything about you know without it having to be the story of Harriet Tubman or about hip-hop you know why can't there be an all-black play about dating with just everybody black or Mexican? You know, or, and it's, it's we, we, are, we are kind of, and, and I wanted to start by saying too that it, change has occurred, right? Um, I tell my students all the time, it, it was not called the Civil Rights Weekend. It was the Civil Rights Movement for a reason. Change takes time. When we're used to thinking a certain way, we have to realize that we are a steady drip on a hard rock to make a groove, that's what my grandma used to say. Um, but with that being said, if we can just move away from this idea of celebrating diversity like it's a birthday that comes around once a year and start normalizing it, stop patting yourselves on the back when you include two people of color and one person who's gay or one person in a wheelchair. No, this all has to be normalized. It has to be what it is. We have to retrain ourselves to stop thinking that diversity is including other people and just make it what it is. But if that makes any sense. It does. Before it can be an unconscious It's going to take a while. No, it's, you're right. It's going to take a while. I think to reprogram a nation of people who for so long have known that, you know, I grew up reading magazines about white girls and learning what they did to their hair and what colors looked good on their skin and, you know, uh, daydreaming about Michael J. Fox and, and everybody else, you know. I, I went to the movies and watched white Disney princesses or animals. You know what I mean? All this stuff. It, it's slowly coming to be. And, it, and, and I guess what I'm saying is we are currently making these conscious decisions, but I think we need to remain conscious. Don't live in the celebration. This is something that if we're going to normalize this, and there shouldn't even be a need for diversity. I kind of hate the word. Because it just means that somebody gets the option of including somebody else. Yeah. And that's that's from a place of privilege. That's born in privilege. And I think that affects like the audiences that you get as well. I mean, I can watch things now that have it, like maybe an entirely black cast. And maybe in the 90s when I was younger and stupid and living in Iowa, I was like, oh, this is a black show. Right? Sure. And now I just watch it and it's just a show. And it, it's like, OK, this is starting to make sense that it wasn't necessarily uh, put forth that way. It was just put forth as a show on the lineup, on this TV, right? And so and that's where I'm struggling having a, a women's theater. And do I need a women's theater? Do I want it to be a women's theater? Why isn't it just a theater? Right. So now I'm a niche theater, and that's never really what I thought I was going to be. You know, and so I, when we were, you know, 
know, sort of getting donations for uh, Planned Parenthood, and I was trying to cover operating costs, and I noticed that, oh, only women donated to this. Um, mostly, That's like, 99% of women are responding on the Facebook page, and I don't, I don't want it to be just for women. It's not like, well, that's you know, it's a kind of razor. You have to think about, like, you know, who are you reaching? Who are you marketing? And that's the problem because we do need the niche to start off with. I mean, we certainly, there was a need for Black History Month because all we were learning was white history. And of course, now that we have it, and it's kind of being, you know, when, when is it okay to get rid of it because it's infiltrated into the rest of history? I mean, those lines are, those lines are blurred. You know, I, I, I honestly think that there aren't a lot of people of color here because we have yet to, you know, reach people of color as a demographic. We, we, we're better at it than we were five years ago. And I say we as in the theater community, um, but I still, I still can look out into any given audience anytime I'm on stage and count the number of people of color on one hand. Still, even if the show is all black, even if it's in February or on Martin Luther King's birthday, it doesn't matter, you know what I mean? And until because it's still those white people yeah. in the boardroom. So it's like, oh, well, this is kind of so the, the theater the has to look at themselves. The artists have to look at themselves and say, all right, whose story am I telling? Just because you have people of color on stage doesn't mean that you're necessarily telling their story. And if you are, who would you get it from? Where did it come from? Who's the playwright? How are you going to how are you going to market this particular story? to this, this market of people and convince them that this is something that they are a part of, not that they need to be a part of, not that they should come and be a part of, that they already are. Come look at this thing that's, that's about us. Come look at this thing that you're a part of. Come be a part of this thing that you've been a part of and we want you to show up. I just, and I don't even know the answer to that. I just know I got really loud and I'm passionate. <laughs> <laughs> I think it um, the queer perspective, although we don't have any trouble getting our people in the theater. We really don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, I do think we have a problem accurately telling our own stories. And um, some of that is because, you know, the, I won't say the wrong demographic, but the demographic that has been in charge is continuously in charge and they don't consider uh, telling stories that truly reflect that, that population. So um, something, thank you Tori for bringing up that diversity is actually counterproductive as a word. I've never thought about it that way, but that's perfect. So thank you for that. Because I'm so passionate about, and a huge reason why I even founded my company is because I think we have to, the only way we're going to really affect change is to actively change the normal setting without calling attention to it. We don't, the normal heart was very important to, uh, story to tell for AIDS awareness and everything, but not everything we need to see needs to be about this fatal illness and this uh, relationship that's crumbling that tells every gay man in the audience that all they are are a disease and an epidemic and this terrible thing that happened um, and continues to happen. You know, we need to, allow these characters, people of color, um, LGBTQ people, disabled people, be in plays, in scripts, where their characteristic quality that we're labeling them with is not their core trait. You know, we can have a lesbian couple in a play that is just, uh, you know, experiencing how to raise their disabled son, or, and well, I guess that's still too categorized. Yeah. But see, we're still- They're so just the wacky neighbors, neighbors yeah. right? They're right. the wacky <laughs> neighbors, and it's not- Or maybe the not wacky neighbors. neighbors. Because yeah. the only reason we got to this point is because for all, multimedia is probably the most dominating force in all our culture. And so no matter what we think, we are affected by that. And I, I became aware about five years ago, I was woke as they say. <laughs> um, that is the correct use of that term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it came to my attention that, you know, if you sit in a, in a movie, 90% of the trailers you see are going to be about a white cis male protagonist trying to find out how they are the most special person on the earth. <laughs> it's true. I'm telling you. And um, I realized that it wasn't until, um, well, I won't go into this because that's really a really embarrassing long story, but <laughs> I've only had one time in my life when I felt like I experienced an art form where my story was reflected in a, a part of me that I've never seen on stage or screen or in music, and it changed my life. It shifted my universe. 
Um, and I'm a critical person. You know, I don't get affected that way really by my art form because I'm constantly analyzing. And this thing took me out and it was because I saw myself for the first time and I was, I thought, oh my God, like every, everybody deserves this, every single kind of person. And we're not gonna get there by calling attention to and saying, well, we're doing a play just for the disabled folk about a disabled kid exactly. who can't make friends. No, it's about the disabled kid who has these dreams about becoming this person and then they accomplish it, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I, yeah, I'm just passionate about establishing a standard of normal without calling attention to it. That's the only way that we're going to make that well, I mean, it, it's not, it's not even not calling attention to it. It's call attention to yourself. Because that's really the only change that you're going to make first. So look at what you're doing. I don't need, necessarily need to see my story. But my story is not the story of every 30-something <laughs> black woman in America. Yeah. I would enjoy going to see the story of a, a queer love story. Or, you know, a, 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 I don't know. Anything else, it's not that, I love friends, don't get me wrong, like, I'm not trying to sit here and say that I need to only see, you know, like, it just, if we're gonna, if we're gonna say that as a country, as a community, we want diversity, then we're gonna have to do the work that it takes to normalize that. And by, by doing the work, that does not mean find your one disabled, queer, person of color friend and inbox them to death about how they feel about what's going on right now. It means you use your good old Google search and you do some freaking research. You find authors of pe by people of color, authors, there are tons of queer authors, they're writing their stories, they're telling you. You don't even have to get it from that one friend that you have and then apologize to them because you've hit them up seven times and I know you're not the spokesperson but this is why I did a show called Your Negro Tour guide, as in I am not <laughs> or Negro tour guide. The information is out there. My perspective isn't unique. That's what's normal about it. My perspective is not unique. But your perspective also doesn't speak for your entire demographic. That is true as well. So I think as far as the question is concerned is how can we shake our heads at the people who won't accept a diverse merit if we are falling short ourselves? How are you falling short? What are you doing? What are you doing in your everyday life that's helping to normalize America? To so the real I, definition I, of normal, bringing, not what's been said. Bringing it back to, to sort of where this intersects with politics, right? Mm -hmm. If the central question of the past presidential election was who gets to be an American? Mm -hmm. Or what does it mean to be an American? And are our purpose in the American theater is to tell the stories of as many different kinds of Americans as possible, and as many kinds of stories about Americans as possible, then also those of us in the most privileged positions have to shut up a little bit and stop telling our stories. We could do a moratorium, 10 years, no more plays about four white people in a New York apartment, one of whom has a terrible secret. <laughs> we don't need to see that play again. <laughs> don't produce it. I don't care if everybody else is. Like, we don't need to see that play again. Well, and I think, looking at it from the individual with disabilities perspective, you know, a couple of years ago I decided this was going to be my focus. And I was like shocked because there was nothing, like, there was literally nothing out there. There was Boys Next Door, which is not a very good play in my opinion. <laughs> Oh. I know, I know, we all love it, we all, but we all loved it 30 years ago before That's we knew somebody with autism. Um, but there's just nothing, because we're so scared of offending people with disabilities that, we, that, we, that we've just chosen as a community to say, let's not do it. People do it all the time. They, they, do, that. they do that all the time. Yeah. They avoid the stories. That but, and when they do tell the story, it's for them, it's for the audience. It's, I'm gonna put Rain Man up here because I want you to go, oh my gosh, that's so sweet, or wow, I feel like I really understand that, and it's, it's to create empathy in the audience rather than to tell an accurate story. So we treat individuals with disabilities on stage as if they're exhibits in a museum for us to go awe at. And I, oh. <laughs> Oh my god, the next point was the thesis. <laughs> um, but, yeah. 
But then, so, if our goal is to tell these honest, honest, and true stories and have it be okay that someone with a disability isn't cute, because they're not all cute, and have it be okay that someone with a disability is not a nice person, because I know a lot of people with disabilities who are huge jerks, and that's where we have really reached inclusion in our society. And the, I remember what the thesis was. <laughs> I knew if I rambled, I'd get to that. Um, one, of the re Thanks. <laughs> one of the reasons why there virtually is very little theater for individuals with disabilities is because people with a severe disability, and I'm not talking about mild to moderate, I'm talking about severe, aren't able to advocate for themselves like someone who is queer, like someone who is of the African American community or the Latino community. And so that's kind of where I come from because they didn't know that they were supposed to be included. And they didn't know that they were not being included. So I guess that's where I come from and that me personally, I feel like right now my main mission is to advocate for them because they can't advocate for themselves. And as an audience member, I think also, and the problem also with administratively, the homogeny that happens in our theater seasons is that the people uh, in the higher privileged position don't realize that they're being exclusive. They don't see that they're not telling everybody's story. And our patrons might not realize that they're being exclusive and don't mind that they've seen the same play about the same four white characters, one quirky one who has the secret, you know? Um, so I think it's also important to be vigilant, not only as artists, but as lawyers, about what we're seeing, and if it, why wasn't I engaged in that? Or why does this feel the same as I've seen before? Or why did this make me uncomfortable? Or why was I bored? Or why was I upset? What would I have liked to have seen? And being active members of our community and voicing that to, to the artists around you or make that art yourself, um, I, I think we just have to be really active about changing it. Lindsay, sometimes we do see. <laughs> we do see and, and we're trying and it's hard and we need to have these conversations, but it's not an overnight fix. And I think like what, you, what you'll see with any arts organization is you'll have programming, you'll have the mission-based programming and you'll have the money-making the valet has to do the nutcracker mm -hmm. so they can pay for new works and to bring in female choreographers for the other parts of their programming. It's a balance so that we can keep the lights on. And I think that, um, again, as, as theater goers, like you're saying, or as symphony goers, or any museum visitors, um, taking a moment to seek out the other programming, the artistic programming that we're putting out there but is not being attended mm -hmm. um, because we put Beethoven 9 on stage because that's what people will pay to see. Um, but when we want to bring in more diverse audiences, more diverse soloists, I'm sorry, I'm using the diverse word. Um, but I mean diverse in thought because there are a lot of different ways. I mean, we had um, a deaf percussionist. It was a really interesting program and not a slam dunk. Um, and I think I see the same thing happening in our theater when we put our hearts out there and then have to give away our tickets because that's not the programming people flock to. And I think, in, I don't like to say that um, we're voting with our wallets because it makes it sound like 